I'm going to show you a track which I made for the festivals, since it's festival season soon. Uh, but the thing I want you to take away from today is that you don't need fancy plugins to make a drop. This drop actually only uses one-shot samples. Um, my laptop is almost dead uh, from all the CPU problems, so using samples really helps my CPU. Uh, I like to sometimes layer up lots of Serum and Spire, but I've really overlooked samples, because a lot of samples are sometimes more powerful than the leads you can create in Spire and Serum and stuff. So I'm going to show you the track. Whoa, CPU starting already. It doesn't normally sound like this. I'm not sure why it's going so crazy right now. Uh, but you kind of got the idea of the drop. So it's like a big room, but as you know, big room is it's changing. A lot of people are abandoning it, so I needed to do something fresh. So I wanted to try get some kind of Moonbaton influence in it. Uh, and I also wanted a little bit of swing so I could play it in the clubs. This has a nice groove, so you can groove to it, but it is also heavy for the festivals as well. So what I'm going to show you first is the drop leads. The main sound is this one. If I was listening to this, I would think, well, this is straight from Serum. It's a very powerful sound. But this is from a sample pack. Uh, Retro Hands, I've started to use a lot of their sounds because they sound design sounds in Serum. And for me, sound design, I'm still learning it. so. I like to take sounds that I've already been took and mastered, basically. So this sound, I've, all I've done here is shortened the sample because it was, if it was long, that's the original sound. So I wanted it to be short and have a very small tail so I could create my own melody with it. Uh, and from then, I, I just had some attack layers. Now this one isn't in key, and I know that, but at this key, it had a nice click on the top end, so I decided to keep it in this key because it's quite a subtle layer, so it's in the background. And you can just hear that nice top end. Uh, and something I love to do is layer up sounds. If you're not a great sound engineer, you can create your own leads by just adding layer on top of layer and EQing them effectively. But these are actually all EQ'd in the same way. Uh, actually, this one's slightly different. Let me check the EQ. It's just a standard thing you will see. Got to have Camel Crusher first. Uh, I love Camel Crusher to really slam the sounds. Great compressor. Uh, I use the British Clean preset. Without it, it would sound pretty flat. <laughs> Not this flat. See how in your face it is? And from then, I found this plugin uh, by the people who make Serum. This is Dimension Expander. Uh, and what this did for my sound, for this particular sound, I use it a lot on bass lines, because it makes the sound deep in the mix. It sounds really uh, low. But it also is a stereo imager as well. It kind of gives that wide sound. Uh, so with, I'll see if you can hear it without us. You probably can't hear there, but when you've got headphones on, this sound just goes completely transformed. Um, and this is probably the most basic uh, mix chain you'll ever see. Uh, I've stopped using Sausage Fatner recently, but I used it on this one, again, just to push the sound, because this sound's already been mastered, this one here. The 
it's been made in Serum or something like that and mastered and lots of effects on it already. So when I took it and add more effects, it gives like a distorted appeal. So this kind of stands out from anyone else uh, who just took the sample and used it like this. Uh, and here's a tip that I do on everything. Uh, I'm not sure if anyone does this, but I absolutely love this plugin. It's insane. And I use the delay section, but I have it on a very kind of a small size, so it acts, it kind of duplicates the sound. It gives it kind of like a, a metallic appeal. I'm not sure if you'll be able to hear it through the speakers here, but... Uh, and if you play with the size, you can get like even more of a, like a rattly sound to it. So it's just something, taking it and making it a little bit weird, and different. See how it's got that kind of metallic sound? I remember hearing a Kirby track from like a couple of years ago, and it sounded so metallic and so uh, delayed, and I was like, how the hell did he do that? Then I came across this, and I've just been using it ever since in all my tracks, whether it's on a bass line or a lead. It's just about taking really simple plugins and making your lead sound different to everybody else. Um, in addition to that, I use the reverb from FL Studio. I've got Valhalla reverb, but I'm still learning how to use that effectively. I just use a, a very simple reverb in FL. It does what I want it to do. I'll play it over like, This is way too dry, especially for a festival track. It needs that big, heavy reverb. And with this reverb, it really feels like it's surrounding the sound. Uh, and from then, it's just a bit of sidechain. And the beauty with this sound is it's already, as I said, it's already been mastered, it's already been EQ'd, so you don't have to do too much to it. Uh, the third layer is another one of these high-end clicks. A horrible sound if you listen to it by itself, but in the mix it sounds good. And I still felt it was a little bit... Uh, Empty, I think, so I did a little bit of a... <laughs> kind of like the sound that uh, Maddox used in our track, Invictus. It's got a nice kind of, it's got a texture to it. This is really clean, this lead, and I wanted something kind of gritty to come in as well. So all together, I think it's, it's quite a, it's a strange lead. I haven't heard a lead like this before. And it seems to work in the clubs, and it's been played at festivals and stuff, so it seems to work there as well. Uh, the, the build up, oh, there's three parts to this drop. Uh, I'll show you the second part. <laughs> then there's a third part, which is like kind of uh, reggaeton inspired with the bass line. And that is all the same lead. Uh, but with this one, I played it on a low octave. So, same melody, but just dr bring the notes down so it's playing on the same octave. But when I did that, because it's a sample, it lost a lot of the high end. So I had to combat that. Um, and what I could do is duplicate a mixing channel so I could set it to mixing channel 12, and then I could right-click, save the mixer track, drag it all the way into 12, uh, and EQ it slightly different, but I decided to just... I hope I haven't done that. Looks like we've done that, but no. Uh, yeah, I just decided to automate the EQ so that I could have a bit of high end. You can hear the EQ automated up here and I wanted it to come back down here. Uh, so as you can, you probably won't be able to hear the difference. It's kind of got the same kind of high end there, so I had to um, make up for the high end that was lost. Now the third is just a different melody with the higher octave playing. It's like a real dirty Dutch, Dutch house kind of melody. Uh, and I wanted to keep it different 
like this track is about trying to please as many kind of D, uh, different DJs who play different genres, because the second drop is actually 150. I wanted to make this track in like 140 BPM, but then I realized, like I did that with the track with Kura, uh, the original idea I sent him was 140. He said, I think we should change it, man, because it alienates the amount of people who are going to play it. If I made that in 140, not many DJs will play it, because a lot of DJs like to play Big Room. So. I've decided from now on when I'm going to make Big Room, I'm going to go 132 because it really gets the energy that 140 has. It's a lot faster than 128, and you can really hear that. Um, but I also kind of wanted a really fast, powerful drop, so I decided to do the second drop, 150. So DJs, if they want to mix this out at 132, they can mix it out fine. But if you want to play the second drop at 150, you can do that. So it's, it gives a lot of options for DJs to play in this track. Uh, see if there's anything else I can show you. The kick is a very subtle kick. It's not a big, big room kick because I wanted emphasis on the drums here. Now EQ wise, literally just spiked up the, the low end a bit. I was finding, trying to find the sweet spot here in my headphones. And I found that this was really the sweet spot, so I spiked it up a little bit, just a little bit, because the sample's already powerful as it is. And I always have all my low end, my kicks, um, the sub part of the kick always in mono, so that everything else in stereo doesn't have to, f they don't have to fight for their own space. Everything has their own space here. Now, I sometimes do that with the percussion. Have I done that in this project? No, the percussion is actually stereo. I'll see this stereo. Uh, Percussion here. Very standard EDM percussion. But it's all about layering. Like for me, I will never just be happy with one sound anymore. I couldn't be happy with just this uh, percussion. So I had to layer it up. Uh, I wanted a l something with a little bit more high end, like a, a kind of shaker effect. And on top of that, uh, yeah, that's it. Uh, I also stole this from a Kura sample pack. Um, this is actually from his track, he bounced it as a stem. But I loved this attack, this kind of big drum sound. And I loved the um, percussion that I used. So I took this, chopped it up a little bit because I didn't want to use all of his kind of thing, just in case people recognize it. You know, I want it to be unique a little bit. Uh, but yeah, all together it sounds like a very complete. Kind of drum collection. Now I've got some little stabs in the background, which you won't recognize in the track, but it really does help add some texture to the drop. So everything doesn't sound like too electronic. It's kind of like a gritty dubstep sound, which I, I love using dubstep wobbles and stuff like that. So, on top of that, I've got a crash. Since the melody is dun 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 dun, dun it always needs something on the stab. So I decided to add a crash, this wobble sound, uh, and that's it for the first section. Uh, and finally, I always add a little one shot to the ba the bass line because with EDM everybody has the same kicks nowadays everyone uses the same thing uh, so what I do is I take one shots from sample packs like this one which is super quiet and what I do is layer it as a layer to the bass line now that kick is mine nobody else has that kick so I've took something that anyone can get and made it my own by one simple trick. And so what I've done to it, it's very, very simple. There's one thing you need to do. Make sure you cut all the low end that you don't need. Always start up here like this. And move it along and see how much you can get away with. Because if you take away all the low end, it's going to lose um, kind of some of its appeal. It's going to just sound kind of messy. But always go by ear. You might know exactly how many hertz to take away from this, that, and the other, but I do by ear. When it sounds good, I'm happy. So always, I always start high and just work out 
what's the perfect sweet spot here. Uh, yeah, boosted the high end a little bit as well, so I could have just like a nice kind of metallic effect to the kick. Now, in terms of fills and stuff, without this fill, I think the drop would be significantly more boring. Uh, I'll show you it now. now that's a I think that's a really sick sound. Like it's it's a really gritty sound. Uh, I actually took it from Splice, and it's a horrible loop. <laughs> So I, I found that bit and I was thinking, shit, this bit is so sick, I need to cut this up. So I took that bit um, yeah, and just duplicated it. Uh, with the EQ, I don't think I've gone too crazy here. Stereo, I just wanted to stereo image it a little bit, just to give it that wide appeal to match the kind of wideness of the drop leads. Um, EQ, the highs were so piercing because it's kind of a... You can really hear the highs already, so without that, it was just too much. It just was, it, wa it wasn't kind of matching the drop lead highs, so I had to take it down so it was all balanced. So it kind of all sounds like it's from a VST. Now, see what else I can show in this. It's a very basic kind of project without using uh, VSTs, but I think it works. It's just as powerful as a track that was made with Serum and stuff, so. I think you've just got to, if, if I was you, I'd go on Splice at one day a week. I do it on a Sunday. I just go through and spend three or four hours downloading stuff. And then Monday, I've got so many fresh ideas because I've got loads of new sounds. Um, if there's anything you want to know from the project, I can take some questions now or we can do questions about other stuff because I can open the break project, but it's going to take probably like 10 minutes. <laughs> so, who wants it? Who wants it? Just, I'm going to take an easy one. <laughs> Please didn't Please have a question, ask a question in the box. You can ask a question. Um, how do you make your kick so powerful? Uh, to be honest, I it's kind of all about that top kick. It's not about the low end, essentially. With this, you need this top kick to really punch through the mix. It's got a really nice crisp top end, but you need a kick with a lot of body as well. If you had a kick which was, for example, it had no low end whatsoever, it would just it just sound flat, so it's all about EQing it. If it's if the kick isn't kind of punching through already, go to a cashmere pack and go through the top kicks, and take one of the really top, t -t 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 -t, or use a hi hat or something on top of the kick, and it's going to give it much more punch. It's going to really punch through the mix. Um, but you can find so many kicks like this. Just they never have that nice click to it, so I always just side chain it so that all this section here is room for my clicky kick. So together, it sounds really powerful. That's it. Okay. Um, easy. <laughs> there's this buzzy noise coming from the speaker. Uh, is it something which we just have to deal with or can someone fix it? Good question. Also, I, I didn't, maybe it's just my ears, but I didn't hear any sound coming from that speaker. Maybe because I'm sitting here, but. Audio malfunctions. Anyway, I don't have a question we, about the project. We can't fix yet. it at the moment, I'm sorry. Someone else want to ask something? <laughs> <laughs> I'll throw it. Anyone got a question just about anything, about the track, about drops, anything? Nope? Oh, good. Well, I, I didn't see where that came from. I can't throw it this far. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Uh, 
I'd like to ask you something uh, concerning your background. Actually, you come from the UK. I've been living in the UK last five years. Really? How much? Yes, I'm from Greece, and uh, nice. I'm doing my PhD in the UK at the University of Kent. Um, Taking into consideration that the UK music scene is centered around bass house, garage, uh, UK deep, something that's quite irrelevant to EDM, how did uh, your upbringing from the UK influence, either positively or negatively, your occupation and development as an EDM artist? To be honest, I feel, yeah, I feel sorry for myself at times because I feel like I've missed out on a lot. I still, to this day, have not played a show in England which really gets to me. All I wanted to do was play one show in England, but because of the way the scene is right now, people don't even listen to Big Room at all, not even in the clubs anymore. So it is tough, uh, and it has made me think to kind of appeal to the UK thing, I need to bring some more deep influences. But I mean, I'm really into house right now. I love house, so I'm taking some influences from house into my music, and I mean, hopefully, the UK crowd can appreciate that. And the dream is to play one show in the UK. Uh, let's see if it happens. But yeah, it is tough. I only discovered EDM when I was like 18 years old. And by that time, people in Holland have been producing for like seven years. So I felt like I started this really late, which is why kind of I haven't kind of got to where I wish I was if I lived here, for example. But you, you can't let that get you down. You've just got to try even harder, I guess. Um, but everything is happening here in Holland, so if you're from Holland, then you're lucky uh, and make the most of it. Does your age also play some sort of role? Because I've seen so many young artists uh, yeah. being slightly or older than, uh, you know, the mass. Is it going to actually have uh, some sort of negative influence? See, I worry that I'm too old. I'm 24 now and I worry that I'm too old. But, I mean... It really doesn't matter about your age right now. Yeah, Martin Garrix is so young and he's done so much, but that kid's just a genius, you know? Don't compare yourself to other people. You are yourself. If, it, if you're still producing music when you're 40 years old, who cares? If you're having fun, it doesn't matter. Thank you very much. Ooh. <laughs> wow, savage. <laughs> this is dangerous. Anyone got any questions? Want to get hit with this? How did you learn all the things that you do in FL Studio? Did you just watch so many YouTube videos or just... Because once upon a time you had to use the program for the first time. Yeah, well, see, I, for about three or four years I didn't watch tutorials. I maybe watched one if I needed to know how to do a certain thing, sidechain for example. Um, but now, in the past two years, I've started to watch tutorials because I realized I'm in this box right now. To get out of this box and really improve as a producer, I need to watch other people. But I literally would just click buttons in FL and just see what happens. See what happens. That's why my music was so shit for so long. Um, but the only reason I can produce, the only reason that I can do this today is because I just did it over and over and over and over again. Just eventually my songs started getting a little bit better. Uh, but I could have got kind of made that process a lot faster if I watched more YouTube tutorials, if I went to a school. Maybe there's a school where you are you can go to and learn music. Because um, I'm still learning all the music theory right now, so I'm trying to catch up to the guys who can play pianos and stuff like that. Uh, so yeah, I, I watch master classes a lot. I watch, I've probably watched every single one. Um, the one from Brooks from Dance Fair last year was a great one, insane one. I've learned a lot from him. And you take little tips that they use, and you're just expanding your brain and expanding what you know. So tutorials are the best way. So if someone would like to start using FL Studio for the first time, we, you would just recommend pressing all the buttons and just see what it does? Nah, I would go, there's a lot of, <laughs> nowadays there's a lot of YouTubes, YouTubers that will show you like the ins and outs of FL Studio, how to make a future bass track, and they'll show you step by step. Um, but I don't think that was really around when I picked it up. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it just depends. If you have no knowledge whatsoever, open it up, have a little bit of fun, click around, see if anything clicks, and it, then go into the YouTube stuff. That's what I'd recommend. Thanks. <gasps> Please say this was on video. <laughs>
That was an accident, I swear. <laughs> this is it. Whose idea was this? <laughs> Sorry, where did it go? Yes. Yeah. Um, how do you make the white sounds in your tracks mono compatible? Uh, how do you mean? As in, when you have a white sound oh. and you play it on a stereo system, how do you make that mono compatible so it sounds the same as in mono and stereo? Well, it's a, when I. I always just stick to the same rule. All my leads need to be stereo, and all my subs and stuff needs to be mono. And if you hear on headphones, I always mix on my headphones and monitors, so I can really tell if something's too stereo or if it's kind of too thin in the mix, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Uh, so just testing it on different speakers and stuff. If you really think, oh shit, this isn't how I need it to be, you need to go back and fix it that way. I yeah, suppose. because for example, when you use stereo shaper sometimes yeah. and you make it too wide and then turn it to mono, you kind of hear like the, the phase. You miss some stuff. Yeah, yeah you, phase. You miss stuff, yeah. yeah. Um, also, when I do with panning, somebody once told me you shouldn't be panning stuff more than kind of 40%, because anything further than that, it's just going to can cause phase issues and stuff. Um, so just make sure you're not doing it too wide. Uh, but you do need to kind of have some width to your lead sounds, which don't push it too far, <laughs> so I would say. Could you also show your master channel? <laughs> yeah, I'll show you my master channel. This is what I do on every single track. This is my master channel. I think I'm the only guy that doesn't use a master channel. Um, because, as I said before, the way I started was just clicking buttons. Uh, and I didn't, I didn't think, yeah, I need to learn mastering now. Because I was still learning how to kind of be a successful DJ and play Tomorrowland and stuff like that. I, that. That was my dream right back then. I didn't think, yeah, I need to master my stuff. So now I'm learning mastering step by step, but I really prefer to send like my reveal tracks. I would much rather let Hardwell master this track. You know, He's an absolutely amazing master, so it's, it's fine to be in his hands. Um, but mastering yourself is important because sometimes you can get a master back and you can think, this isn't how I wanted it. So mastering it yourself, you can be 100% sure that it's going to sound the way you want it to sound. Is that a yawn or a hand up or a stretch? We need to... I'm, I'm not going to throw it. I have a question first. Okay. Uh, um, so you literally, literally sent unmastered demos to uh, Revealed. Yeah, but the thing is, mine don't sound like a normal unmastered. It doesn't sound flat. You can see how I slam my sounds with Camel Crush and stuff like that. I'm, my stuff, all my bootlegs, for example, are always fine to play in the clubs. I always have the volume, and I also kind of have the dynamics, the way I produce it. Uh, and I mix down really, like, I kind of essentially master all my samples. I could just not use Camel Crusher on my stuff and make a track at minus 6 dB and master it afterwards and have the same kind of thing, but I like to do it as I'm going through. It's a very strange way to do it. Um, but yeah, I always get the volume from the way I process my sounds. I always really slam my sounds really hard in your face. So that's where I get the volume from. All right, thank you. Thanks. I'm not gonna throw it back there, I refuse. <laughs> Have we got a mic? It's all the way back there, though. Why did it actually take so long to release Phoenix with Blaster Jacks? Uh, okay, so the first version we made in like 2014 or something. Um, kind of time just went by and we didn't finish it. And by then, EDM had moved on so much, so we decided, let's make a new drop. Then we made a new drop, and it was too similar to Dimitri Vegas and Like Mike's track with Futuristic Polar Bears at the time, so we decided, yes, yeah, scrap it. And then I, peop I just got constant abuse from people. Where's Phoenix? I need Phoenix right now. So one day I was in the studio with Idia and we were just working on our own stuff. And then I said, uh, you know, why don't we just finish it? Because it was almost done. Um, so we did the final touches to it and eventually got released. So I'm glad it's out there now, but it was a long time. And at the time it happened, I remember Blaster Jacks said, this is our new tr track with Ollie James. And this was at Ultra Music Festival. 
and nobody made a sound. I was expecting to hear some cheers, some excitement, just silence. But from that day, I was so excited. I was thinking, this track's going to be the big one for me. So it was kind of shit that I didn't come out until now, but I'm glad it's finally out there. Wait, I, I can do this. Everybody's ducking, everyone's scared. <laughs> All right, if you start your project like new, where yeah. do you begin? Always with the drop. For me, like I'm obsessed with making drops, so I will always start with the drop. And then with the lead or the kick? What kick, point? always with the kick. Depends what kind of, I think with this one, when I found this sample, I thought, yeah, <coughs> I, I'm gonna do something with this, but I can't really work out if it's gonna be a good drop by just having the lead. I need a kick there as well. So then I'll find a nice kick, so something that maybe is not going to be the final kick, but it can just be the temporary kick while I build a drop around it. Uh, and then from then, once I've got the kick and the drop lead, this is where all this stuff comes in. So I've got these things right now. So now I'm kind of thinking, what else needs to come here? And this is where all this shit comes in. Uh, Let's, let's find some drums now. So I'm looking for drums, I'm layering up the drums. Okay, I'm happy, but now it seems a little bit empty. Here comes all the effects. So I'm looking through the cashmere pack. Now it's getting there. Then I look for these kind of stabs, because a, a good stab at the start of your EDM song can completely make the track. If it's gonna really help, it's gonna really help your track to slam straight away. So when I've got all this stuff, I just add the really small details, like these little um, <coughs> fills and things. Uh, and from then, I'll make a breakdown, because breakdowns I don't have that much fun making. I have so much fun making drops. Breakdowns I find a little bit boring sometimes. So I, t <laughs> I tend to leave the breakdown until after the drop's finished. Um, and then from then, I make my intros. And a lot of people say they hate making intros but I absolutely love it. All I do is this, copy and paste the drop, take out the drop leads, paste it at the beginning of the track, and then start adding stuff and taking little bits away. Because uh, I love to work fast. If I've got an idea in my head, I need it down on paper before I forget it. So that's basically how I structure my tracks. And then I've got a full structure, and then I'll come back the next day, um, leave myself some notes, and just fix it up then. Have you got the... Yeah, you throw it. Hi, I wanted to know uh, how did you got uh, discovered by yeah, a, like a major label like Revealed Recordings? What is your story? Uh, with Revealed, it was actually, I think I got my bootlegs played a couple of times. Uh, I sent my bootlegs out um, and Hardwell got hold of some of them and played them in his show. And from then, uh, I got an email asking if I had any demos for the sampler. And when I got that email, I was like, oh shit. I was in panic mode. I was like, I need something, I need something. So I was gathering all my best tracks and sent them. And one of them was Raid with some other guys from um, Revealed as well, Steve Reese and Relax. And they decided to sign that one. And from then, it was just, I was just obsessed. I was like, Sh I need a follow up track. So. I then had contact with Revealed, and from then I could send more stuff, and it was a lot easier to get my music to them. Um, but now they have this feature, which I would have killed for back then, the Revealed um, DJ website. So easy to submit your tracks and be track of the week on Hardwell on Air. So it's really easy to get your music to Revealed now. Something I just wish I had, but yeah. Okay, that was thank you. Thanks. I'll take it. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Hasn't got a very good grip, this thing. <laughs> uh, maybe I should, do you want to, do you guys want to hear the breakdown? It's a, <laughs> damn sold. It's going to take a long time to do, so if you guys have got any more questions, um, I can actually play you the breakdown while it takes forever to load. 
if it plays. No. No sound. <laughs> Is this it? No, it's supposed to be coming through. This is coming through the HDMI, isn't it? Uh, yeah, you have to speakers. So basically that was the break. It's not super melodic, but I wanted to keep it like a moving breakdown, so no big synths. Uh, it starts with good energy and it has good energy the whole way through. So it's perfect for the clubs and also for the festivals. Uh, and like, I just love making breakdowns like this, which are constantly moving. There's always something there, rather than kind of the plucks from 2013. The, that kind of, the sound kind of moved on since then. Um, it's not actually a big project, even though it's having a meltdown right now. Um, but the main sound there was a brass noise from Nexus, from the EDM pack. Uh, a lot of you have probably heard that a million times before. And the vocal as well is quite a well-known vocal. But it just worked. Because I didn't have it the whole way through, uh, I think actually Hardwell and Quintino used this in one of their tracks. And I only realized this like, a long time afterwards, but I only use one of the words from it. Uh, let's see if it loads up. <laughs> this plugin is amazing, by the way. I don't know if you guys are using it. Um, it's called Endless Smile by Dada Life, who makes sausage fatner. That's why it's got like a weird little face. But it, it's insane for your build-up. It has reverb and delay and other stuff inside this one plugin. And someone who likes one button plugins like me, I just love that stuff, just being able to transform my track with one button. Um, so that works really well. It's a really great uh, thing to build tension in your build up. Uh, so I bounced the brass noise, save on that CPU. And it's. Wrong button. Uh, I think it sounds like a real kind of brass noise, and I have just got contact recently, uh, so I think I could get a more realistic brass noise, but at the time, all I had was Nexus. But the Nexus brass is just amazing. But I felt like, again, this, it's, it didn't have the high end I wanted. Even when I EQ'd some high end onto it, it just didn't have that kind of effect that I wanted. I wanted kind of a crisp sound. So I added a really horrible spire lead which is horrible by itself, but 
can see how it's almost got that click sound to it. It's got the high end. And the bass line is a huge bass line with a lot of like crisp to it. Like I love having a texture in my tracks, something like makes it sound kind of authentic and less kind of electronic. And then I've got this. Sorry? Can anyone in the back hear this? No. Is it only them? Or? Yeah. Great tip there, thanks. <laughs> it's because it's quite low on my computer right now. And I've got this kind of weird, housey, silent um, sound, which I'm automating the cutoff because I needed something to move throughout it, unless because it would be the same kind of melody over and over again. So I needed something in the background to switch that up. And then I brought in these massive siren sounds. Which sound really cool, but it was quite tough to mix these together without them both fighting for the, the top spot. As you can see, I've EQ'd and balanced the mix of the horns to be just slightly behind um, the Nexus brass. But all that is is just volume mixing. I haven't done any EQ, and it was already a pretty nice sound and sample. I just wanted a little bit of reverb tail onto it so it didn't just stop. Um, and from then, it's just kind of getting repetitive around this spot. So I needed something which just caught everybody off guard. Uh, and this is where this comes in. The and this is just something to change up the, the breakdown and kind of indicate that the build-up's coming and the, the next drop is going to come in as well. Uh, yeah, all it is here is uh, lots of things on top of each other. Um, cashmere sounds. I couldn't use this or this just by themselves because it would make the track sound cheap because everybody's done this now. So I needed to have some stuff on top of that uh, and just use those to kind of fill up the mix. Uh. And here's a revealed Stab. This is the plug for the reveal drop stab sample pack. I, I love those. There's some really sick stabs in there. But yeah, then it goes into the third project, which is the 150 drop. I decided to do it in three projects to save on the CPU. But uh, yeah, I think that's it's a very simple track. It works really well in my experience. Uh, and anybody can do that. Anyone can literally pick up a sample and EQ it the way I have and do that. Anyone can do it, but you've just got to find that right sample and find good layers to go with it. Um, so let that be a little bit of inspiration if you're, if you're looking in Serum thinking, shit, I can't do anything in this. I'm just really struggling. Look through samples. I've been overlooking them for so many years now. Um, and you can find some absolute gems, especially on Splice. So if you have any last questions, how long do we have? Four minutes. Four minutes. So, if anyone, there's a question right at the back, but I'm not going to throw it. I'm not going to risk it anymore. Is the, the mic? Yeah. Hi, Oli. Um, can you please show me how you change the tempo without changing the pitch? Uh, in studio, because every time I change the tempo, the pitch uh, changes as well. Yeah, I've literally done a video on this for my YouTube channel. I recorded it the other day. Uh, like, I did it in Escobar, and I know what you mean. When you change the tempo of the track, the sample just stretches. So, I think in FL Studio 12, is that what you use? <laughs> wow. If you use 12, I think when you 
automate the BPM, the sample stays the same. But because I'm in 11, I don't have that feature and I'm, I'm just too scared to upgrade to 12. So what I do is I always have a down lifter like this. Um, something which doesn't have a key, so just to uh, cash me a down lifter, the which you won't really notice the change in key. Um, let's see if I can do it. I don't think the sample, yeah, they are going to show. Because uh, in my track, Escobar did that. Um, see, one of these sweet down works perfectly. So, the drop here is 132 BPM. I'm going to copy the value. So this section is going to stay at 132. Uh, so I want to go down to 98 BPM. But I'm not going to stretch all the channels because everything's going to get distorted. So I'm going to create an aut automation clip for this. And I would say this section here, when the sweep's coming down, I think this bar here is perfect. So I'm going to take the value of this, copy in the value, and paste it here. Now, this sample, you won't hear the distortion. I can even stretch it to the grid like this, and it won't move. And then from there, you just start your breakdown. Personally, I would have something like this. Go from EDM to reggaeton. And then for the way back up, this is a, this is a tough thing. But if you're using a drop lead in silent, for example, it will not stretch that. If your, your VSTs will not be affected, but it will uh, go up in tempo. So in the section where you want to come back up, I usually come, up, come back up, then have the build up at the tempo the drop is. So I would build it up using the drop synth. It'll go slowly, slowly, go up to 128 BPM, then the build up comes. Uh, so I hope that helped. But just play around with it and just make sure this section, you're not going to use anything kind of key related. But you can have a stab because when the tempo's fallen, the stab will have ended by the time the kind of slow comes down. So yeah, just play around with it, I'd say. Oh, thank you so much. Is that it? Done. Well, thank you everyone for coming and hope to see you guys soon.